The Revolution of Everyday Life by Raoul Vanagam. Chapter 9. Technology and its Mediated Use. Contrary to the interests of those who control its use, technology tends to disenchant the world. Mass consumption society strips gadgets of any magical value. Similarly, organization, a technique for handling new techniques, robs new productive forces of their, of their subversive appeal and their power of disruption. Organization thus stands revealed as nothing but the pure organization of authority. Alienated mediations make man weaker as they become indispensable. A social mask disguises people and things. In the present stage of pri- privative appropriation, this mask transforms its wearers into dead things, commodities. Nature no longer exists. To rediscover nature means to reinvent it as a worthwhile adversary by constructing new social relationships. With the expansion of material equipment, the old hierarchical society is bursting at the seams. The same bankruptcy is evident in non-industrial civilizations, where people are still dying of starvation, and automated civilizations where people are already dying of boredom. Every paradise is artificial. The life of a Trobriand islander, rich in spite of ritual and taboo, is at the mercy of a smallpox epidemic. The life of an ordinary Swede, poor in spite of his comforts, is at the mercy of suicide and survival sickness. Rousseauism and pastoral idols accompany the first throbbings of the industrial machine. The the ideology of progress as one finds it in Condorcet or Adam Smith emerged from the old myth of the four ages. With the age of iron leading into the golden age, it seemed natural that progress should fulfill itself as a return, a return to the state of innocence before the fall. The belief in the magical power of technology goes hand in hand with its opposite, the movement of disenchantment. The machine is the model of the intelligible. There is no mystery, nothing obscure in its drive belts, cogs, and gears. It can all be explained perfectly. But the machine is also the miracle that is to transport man into the realms of happiness and freedom. Besides, this ambiguity is useful to its masters. The old con about happy tomorrows and the green grass over the hill operates at various levels to justify the rational exploitation of men today. Thus, it is not the logic of disenchantment that shakes people's faith in progress so much as the inhuman use of technical potential, the way that its mystical justification begins to grate. While the laboring classes and the underdeveloped peoples still offered the spectacle of their slowly decreasing material poverty, the enthusiasm for progress still drew ample nourishment from the, tro- the troughs of liberal ideology in its extension, socialism. But a century after the spontaneous demystification of the, the Leon's workers, when they smashed the looms, a general crisis broke out, springing this time from the crisis of big industry. Fascist regression, sickly dreams of a return to artisanry and corporatism, the Ubesque master race of blonde beasts. Today, the promises of the old society of production are raining down on our heads in an avalanche of consumer goods that nobody would venture to call manna from heaven. You can hardly believe in the magical power of gadgets in the same way as people used to believe in productive forces. There's a certain hagiographical literature on the steam hammer. One cannot imagine much on the electric toothbrush. The mass production of instruments of comfort, all equally revolutionary according to to the publicity handouts, has given the most unsophisticated of men the right to express an opinion on the marvels of technological innovation in a tone as familiar as the hand he sticks up the barmaid's skirt. The first landing on Mars will pass unnoticed on Blackpool Beach. Admittedly, the yoke and harness, the steam engine, electricity, and the rise of nuclear energy all disturbed and altered the infrastructure of society, though this was almost accidental. But today it would be foolish to expect new productive forces to upset modes of production. 
The blossoming of technology has seen the birth of a super technology of synthesis, which could prove as important as the social community. That first of all technical syntheses, founded at the dawn of time. Perhaps more important still, for if cybernetics was taken from its masters, it might be able to free human groups from labor and from social alienation. This was precisely the project of Charles Fourier in an age when utopia was still possible. But between Fourier and the cyberneticians who control the operational organization of technology lies the distance between freedom and slavery. Of course, the cybernetic project claims that it is already sufficiently developed to be able to solve all the problems raised by the appearance of a new technique, but don't you believe it? One, the permanent development of productive forces, the exploding mass production of consumer goods, promise nothing. Musical air conditioners and solar ovens stand unheralded and unsung. We see a weariness coming, and one that is already so obviously present that sooner or later it's bound to develop into a critique of organization itself. Two, for all its flexibility, the cybernetic synthesis will never be able to conceal the fact that it is only the superseding synthesis of the different forms of government that have ruled over men in their final stage. How could it hope to disguise the inherent alienation that no power has ever managed to shield from the weapons of criticism and the criticism of weapons? By laying down the basis for a perfect power structure, the cyberneticians will only stimulate the perfection of refusal. The programming of new techni techniques will be shattered by the same techniques turned to its own use by another kind of organization, a revolutionary organization. Two. Oh, sorry, I already said two. Technocratic organization raises technical mediation to its highest point of coherence. It has been known for ages that the master uses the slave as a means to appropriate the objective world, that the tool only alienates the worker as long as it belongs to a master. Similarly, in the realm of consumption, it's not the goods that are inherently alienating, but the conditioning that leads their buyers to to choose them and the ideology in which they are wrapped. The tool in production and the conditioning of choice and consumption are the mainstays of the fraud. They are the mediations which move man the producer and man the consumer to the illusion of action and a real passivity and transform him into an essentially dependent thing. The stolen mediations separate the individual from himself, his desires, his dreams, and his will to live. And so people come to believe in the myth that you can't do without them, or the power that governs them. Where power fails to paralyze with constraints, it paralyzes by suggestion, by forcing everyone to use crutches of which it is the sole supplier. Power, as the sum of alienating mediations is only waiting for the holy water of cybernetics to baptize it into the state of totality. But total power does not exist, only totalitarian powers. And the baptism of cybernetics has already been cancelled owing to lack of interest. Because the objective world, or nature if you prefer, has been grasped by means of alienated mediations, tools, thoughts, false needs, it ends up surrounded by a sort of screen, so that, paradoxically, the more man transforms himself in the world, the more it becomes alien to him. The veil of social relations envelops the natural world totally. What we call natural today is about as natural as nature girl lipstick. The instruments of praxis do not belong to the agents of praxis, the workers. And it is obviously because of this that the opaque zone that separates man from himself and from nature has become a part of man and a part of nature. Our task is not to rediscover nature, but to make a new one, to reconstruct it. The search for the real nature, for a natural life that has nothing to do with the lie of social ideology, is one of the most touching naivetes of a good part of the revolutionary proletariat not to mention the anarchists and such notable figures as the young Wilhelm Reich. <clears throat> In the realm of the exploitation of man by man, the real transformation of nature only takes place through the real transformation of the social fraud. 
and no point in their struggle have man and nature ever been really face to face. They have been kept apart by what mediates this struggle, hierarchical social power and its organization of appearance. To transform nature was to socialize it, but they certainly made a mess of the job. There is no nature other than social nature, since history has never known a society without power. Is an earthquake a natural phenomenon? It affects men, but it affects them only as alienated social beings. What is an earthquake in itself? Suppose that at this point there was an earthquake disaster on Alpha Centauri. Who would it bother apart from the old farts in the universities and other centers of pure thought? And death. Death also strikes men socially. In the first place, because the energy and resources poured down the drain of militarism and wasted in the anarchy of capitalism and bureaucracy could make a vital contribution to the scientific struggle against death. But above all, because it is in the vast lab, rab, laboratory of society and under the benevolent eye of science, that the foul brew of culture in which the germs of death are spawned is kept on the boil. Stress, nervous tension, conditioning, pollution, latrogenic disease. Only animals are still allowed to die a natural death, some of them. Could it be that after disengaging themselves from the animal world by means of their history, men might come to envy the animal's contact with nature? This is, I think, the childish meaning which should be seen in the search for the natural. But if we could enrich it and set it off in the right direction, such a desire would mean that we had superseded 30,000 years of history. What we have to do now is to create a new nature that will be a worthwhile adversary, that is, to re-socialize it by liberating the technical apparatus from the sphere of alienation, by snatching it from the hands of rulers and specialists. Only at the end of our process of social disalienation will nature become a worthwhile opponent and a society in which man's creativity will not come up against man himself as the first obstacle to its expansion. Technological organization can't be destroyed from the outside. Its collapse is the result of internal decay. Far from being punished for its Promethean aspirations, it is dying because it never escaped from the dialectic of master and slave. Even if the cybernauts did not did come to power, they'd have a hard time staying there. The very best they can offer has already been turned down in these words from, from a black worker to a white boss. When we first saw your trucks and planes, we thought you were gods. Then after a few years, we learned how to drive your trucks, as we shall soon learn how to fly your planes. And we understood that what interested you most was manufacturing trucks and planes and making money. For our part, what we are interested in you interested in is using them. Now you are just our metal workers.